When the coronavirus pandemic arrived in the United States, it spared no community. While some contend that the virus itself has had lesser impact to date in locations, no one has been spared the economic fallout. That couldn't ring truer for upstate New York, who will, in the best case scenario, at least see a significant decline in tourism over the next 12 to 18 months. That will have a huge impact on small businesses throughout the Finger Lakes, Central New York, and Southern Tier. Joining me today is Steve Balger, Regional Director for the Small Business Administration, overseeing a multi-state operation. Steve, welcome to you, and thanks for taking the time. I'd like to start with the Payroll Protection Program. Has it worked? Yeah, overall, my honest assessment is I think it's been a really good success. Uh, I hear from so many small businesses who have been helped by it. Uh, Look, there's no question, especially when it first rolled out, There were some challenges, challenges on the technology side, uh, challenges on who was supposed to get the money, uh, different things like that. But over the course of the last, uh, going on six weeks now with the program, it's really uh, really come together nicely to the point now where uh, we, you know, there's still a lot of money left in the program, which is my main message today. And it's, uh, in, in terms of the process, it's really working well and easier for small businesses to work with their lenders and get a PPP loan. Would it have been a little short-sighted at the outset of this to assume that there wouldn't have been any challenges or any sort of hiccups along the way as a program of this size was rolled out for what I, I assume is the first time ever, correct? Well, let let me put it, I guess, in a little perspective. So normally, the SBA does about $30 billion in lending a year. We have now done, we're approaching $600 billion in a little over six weeks. So the scale is just off the charts. uh, And it's involved, it's certainly not just the SBA, but our lenders, our banks, our credit unions, everybody involved. And yeah, so there were some hiccups out of the gate, uh, but at the same time, over 4.3 million companies across the country, and small businesses, of course, have gotten funding. And that, to me, is really the bottom line. Did the money get to where it was needed? In the overwhelming number of cases, that answer is yes. What do the efforts look like right now to uh, get that money to the places where uh, maybe it still does need to get or it hasn't gotten to yet? The most important thing we're trying to do is raise awareness that there's still plenty of money left. Over $100 billion is left in the program. Right now, uh, the program is scheduled to run till the end of June. So there's a lot of time left. If you're a small business or, very importantly, an eligible nonprofit, We want more nonprofits to take advantage of this as well. Um, Get with a lender. Go to SBA.gov. We have a list of hundreds and hundreds of lenders across New York State that can help you apply for this loan. And it should go pretty quickly. We want the money to go out. What has been the biggest piece of feedback that you've received from uh, folks on the ground, from the the people who are sort of uh, living this day to day and, and putting those funds to use? It's, it's very helpful. I think it depends. Uh, that's a, a really good question. I think it depends what industry you're in, right? One of the hardest hit industries is, has been hospitality and restaurant industry. No question about it. And we've gotten a lot of pushback from that industry that, well, you know, I'm supposed to pay my employees even if they're not working because that is the design of the program. But I'm really going to need the money when I reopen whenever that is, because, you know, business is going to be slow and we get that. So I think, uh, but on the other hand, there's many industries and uh, small businesses that have been able to keep paying their employees and it's really been a godsend for them. So it, it hasn't been universal. I think there's more tweaks coming out of Washington uh, soon, which will hopefully address some of this. But overall. Uh, I ran into a small business owner I know yesterday at the post office dropping something off. And he, he said, hey, this 
this kept me in business. I've been able to pay my staff. I've been able to keep going. So, so overall, I think it's been positive. What are you hearing in terms of concerns? You mentioned it a, a, a little bit a second ago, uh, consumer demand and, and what that might look like and how that might affect some small business owners in different parts of the country. Obviously, it's going to be a very regional thing as different regions and different parts of the country reopen, but what, what's sort of the broad assessment? Well, that's the, you put your finger on the million dollar question, literally, is what, how is this going to change consumer spending patterns, uh, just shopping patterns, eating out patterns, uh, going to event patterns, all those things that we've all been thinking about. And I wish I had a better crystal ball to be able to say, you know, well, everything will just get back to normal or, oh, you know, it's going to be awful. I don't think it's going to be either. I think it's going to be somewhere in the middle. And over time, uh, I think we're going to see uh, some areas. And it's also regional. I think uh, here in, in the central New York area, um, Finger Lakes area, you're going to get back on board and recovering faster than New York City, just because of the way the impact that New York City has has felt from this. So it's going to vary by region. and But we're, what we're certainly seeing and sensing is, certainly from the small business community, they want to get back open. They, you know, they it, they feel it's time uh, outside of the city. They feel it's time across the state to start opening back up. It seems like everyone who's in a position of authority or in some sort of organizational sense uh, at the state level, the federal level, whatever the case may be, small business owners are bombarding them with questions, uh, yeah. oftentimes well beyond the scope of their actual practice. Um, I'm curious, uh, what are some of the big questions, uh, whether it be related to protective equipment or maybe opening practices or best practices, what are some of the big questions that you guys are getting that you think probably will at some point need a little bit of guidance to shape uh, how some of these small businesses reopen and get going so that they can uh, make money again? Yeah, uh, two-part answer to that good question. Right now, almost all the questions we're getting are on PPP and the loan programs and, you know, because there's always some one-off situations that the rules or the guidelines, well, I have a little bit of a wrinkle in my situation. How is this going to work? So answering small businesses on those individual questions has, has taken up a tremendous amount of time for us. And that's what we're here for. We're here to answer those questions and make sure uh, you know, the com companies can get their money. But you also uh, put your finger on a bigger thing. How's the reopening going to look? What do small businesses have to take, uh, take into account? And we're working with our resource partners at uh, the Small Business Development Centers, Women's Business Centers, our SCORE volunteers to help mentor and counsel, develop plans to help mentor and counsel small businesses on best practices, uh, what they're going to need to do, what to avoid. And certainly one of the things to avoid that we're seeing is a lot of the scammers out there. There's a lot of that going on. Uh, and we're trying to warn small businesses to, you know, be, be very thorough and checking, checking anything out before you give your information out. But overall, that will be the next stage for us at the Small Business Administration is coming up with guidance to help the reopening. When one of the pieces of feedback that we've gotten thus far uh, is concern from certain small business owners who aren't sure if they should go after PPP money because they don't know if they will be able to reopen or if they will be able to sustain their business beyond, say, six to 12 months because of um, a, a broader sort of economic downturn. What do you say to those individuals and what's sort of the, I guess, maybe the pep talk that comes along with that? Well, I think it, it gets back to the intent of Congress and the administration of what the PPP is for. And it really is in the name, the Paycheck Protection Program. It's designed to keep employees and small business owners to keep a paycheck coming to them during this shutdown time, whether they are open or not, whether the employees are furloughed, whether they're working every day, whatever the situation, because we want to make sure that 
small business employees keep getting not only a paycheck, but also their benefits for their family, their healthcare benefits, retirement benefits, that that keeps going until the reopening period gets here and things can start moving forward. We'll see what Congress is going to do uh, for the next stage, right? Because right now, PPP is designed for the shutdown stage, not really the reopening stage. So my advice would be take advantage of the program now. Keep money flowing to yourself, your employees, and keep your benefits in place because that's, what, that's the design and intent of the program. What is, when you look forward at the next, say, three to six months, um, obviously no one's really looking beyond that because that would be vaccine time. Um, what are some of like the best case scenarios that you see playing out for small business owners um, who, who maybe are pretty concerned about their viability uh, moving forward? Well, I think it's going to be, again, I think it's going to be uh, industry dependent. It, there's going to be a, a fairly wide variety the real, the, the one we're really looking at that we hope comes back soon is the restaurant industry. How quickly will people be comfortable to start going out to eat again? And, uh, you know, I think that will depend a little bit on geography and, and, and the circumstances. But uh, so it will be industry dependent. And I, we do think, though, that once, once some confidence returns, that's the key thing is, you know, we, people need confidence that when they open their business, they're going to have customers again, they can get back into the game and that there's enough confidence for people to realize, you know what, I can get back to my life. I'm going to have to practice certain things that I never had to do before, but they have the confidence that they're not going to get sick when they go back out and, uh, you know, try and get going again. When you think about rural communities, I think about a, about a year ago when you and I sat in our studio um, and we talked about the Finger Lakes and the Southern Tier and Central New York and some of the more rural communities. Um, how does this or how has this impacted those communities differently from the SBA's perspective than, say, um, a New York City or some of the more larger metro areas in the Northeast? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's had a, a tremendous impact. Uh, Maybe for different reasons, but a lot of it, a lot of the same reasons, really, that the demand has fallen off for uh, products and services. Certainly in agriculture, we've seen that. And we've been trying, and you're working with USDA, trying to come out with more programs now to address that. Uh, there have been tweaks to our program, the Paycheck Protection Program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, to make sure that it is available to farmers and ag-related businesses because they've been hit hard. Uh, with the restaurants being closed, there's a lot less demand for their products. So yeah, it, I think it's it, it all ties together. And it's really, I can't say that uh, the metro versus suburban versus rural areas are all that much different in the impacts. We see it across the board. When you look at travel and the potential changes and shifts in, in habit there, um, for the Finger Lakes, obviously, tourism is a big, big driver, right. um, $6 billion driver, in fact. I, my question to you is, what are your thoughts on sort of the medium to long term on uh, tourism, travel, and how that might affect some of the, the small businesses uh, in the region? I think that uh, in terms of tourism, and travel, you're going to see that will come back because people, <laughs> I know just speaking for me and a lot of people I talk to, we want to get out of the house. We want to go start doing things and we kind of have a little bit more money in our bank now because we haven't been spending as much. So I think there's that demand for tourism, that end of it is going to be, uh, uh, eventually it will get back to a strong, strong point. Certainly if uh, energy prices remain low and there's going to be a lot of specials out there. Where I think it's going to be more of a challenge is the business travel uh, and conferences, things like that, because that is, you know, what we're seeing, and this is one of the uh, second and third order impacts of this whole thing, is a greater reliance on technology like this, where we can do these remote interviews. We're having meetings every night all the time with my team via the internet of one form or another. And people are starting to realize, you know what, this works. 
and it's a little bit easier and I don't have to worry about traveling somewhere. So I think that's going to be the bigger impact uh, on the hospitality industry. And that's a significant concern because there are certainly some, uh, some places in the Finger Lakes like to host business conferences and getaways and seminars. And we're just going to have to wait and see. Hopefully those will return strong, but maybe not right away. Remote work, what says you about that? Because that has become the most interesting and, and maybe buzzworthy topic of discussion out of the pandemic in sort of what work will look like moving forward. What, what are your thoughts there? Josh, huge impact from this on that. We're seeing that. We're talking about it ourselves. Uh, you know, my, uh, I got 20 offices across my two regions. Everybody's been working from home and they've been doing it. We've been getting the job done. It's different. There's some challenges, but overall, uh, and we're certainly not alone. I'm hearing that people are seeing that everywhere. I think what you're going to see is significant changes that I think are going to have a pretty big impact, especially on metro areas, uh, bigger cities where you got these big buildings and you got to travel in, sometimes on public transportation, which people are not really keen on right now. So I think it's going to have a big impact. I think it's going to be very good uh, for uh, uh, suburban and, and rural areas. More people are going to say, you know what? I can do this job working from home. And as long as I have good internet connectivity, that's the key. Uh, if I have that, then you know what? I really don't want to work in New York City, for example. And uh, I'd rather do it somewhere else. So I think you just put your finger on one of the really big changes that's going to come out of this situation, which is being driven in part by technology advances. The last time you and I talked, uh, it was with uh, the USDA uh, as well, and it was all about broadband access and how that's evolving, especially in rural communities. Do you think that's one of the big focus areas for a lot of the, the federal and state agencies as they look past the pandemic and, and look at ways to uh, make a lot of these communities more work from home friendly or, or more uh, ready for this century? I think it has to be. Uh, and look, you've been following it for a long time. I've been, I've been involved in it for a while now. And yeah, you know, rural broadband access, important topic. There's money that comes out every year and, and the elected officials give it a high priority and, you know, okay, good, they should. But it really hasn't, in my opinion, this is just me speaking, there have been some improvements, but it hasn't been widespread enough. And that, I think, is going to have to be a top priority, particularly because it impacts everything. It Im impacts our education system. It impacts our commerce. It impacts our recreational system. Everything that, all aspects of our lives. So I really hope coming out of this that our nation really puts, stops just talking about it and throwing some money at it, but comes up with a plan that really just says, look, this might take half a trillion dollars to do or more, but working with the private sector partners, because they have to get it done, uh, we have to finally get that done, just like we electrified the whole country back in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Steve, my last question for you. Um, as you look forward, what is the most important thing that the SBA is working on in the next, say, uh, month to two months? And what are, the, what are the directions you're pointing folks who are running small businesses right now? Two things. The, our most immediate focus right now is, as I mentioned earlier, we want people who haven't taken advantage of the Paycheck Protection Program to go online, go to sba.gov, find a lender, learn about the program, and apply. The money is there. The forgiveness terms are there. And, and that's the second part of what we're working on right now. Uh, we think in June, it's going to be a very busy month for us because most of the loans will be coming due in their eight week forgiveness period timeframe next month. And we wanna be able to you know, help guide companies if they have any questions on that. So getting all these uh, 4.3 million loans forgiven is our, helping companies do that is our top priority. Beyond that, we are gonna to be tooling up uh, new programs, our 
existing loan programs that we've had for many, many years, our 7A program, for example, we're going to be working with Congress to really beef that up uh, in an appropriate way so that it's attractive for borrowers and lenders to get that government guaranteed loan moving forward. So that's probably our biggest focus moving forward. As always, Steve, appreciate the time. Thanks for, uh, thanks for taking it and thanks for uh, talking with us. Great to be with you, Josh. Thanks. Good luck, everybody.